In the early days of man's life on the earth, when everything was beautiful and new, there was no sickness anywhere, nor any pain, nor sorrow. Men lived to be very old and very wise, and everywhere was happiness, such has never been since in all the world. Now Jupiter had not forgotten about the stealing of the sacred fire, and it angered him that man should light his own fires, and kindle the cheerful blaze which should by right be glowing only in the halls of Olympus. The suffering of Prometheus had not softened his wrath. He would not be satisfied until punishment was visited upon those who had received the stolen fire. Accordingly he called a council of the gods, and spoke to them of his desire. Though none of the deities wished to see misfortune brought upon the race of man, they did not dare to dispute the will of Jupiter. So they agreed to carry out the plan that he unfolded, and before many days had passed they had fashioned, out of the same clay from which man was made, a creature that they called woman. To her each of the gods gave a gift, such as softness, or grace, or wonderful fairness. But Jupiter added one other quality, curiosity, and he gave the woman the name of Pandora, which means the gift of all the gods. Then he bade Mercury, who is the messenger of the gods, take this new soft thing down to the earth, and give her to Epimetheus for his wife. Now Epimetheus had mourned apart from his fellows ever since he learned of his brother's dreadful fate, and he sat day and night in the cool silence of the forest, brooding over his sorrow. But one day he saw someone coming toward him, led by the hand of Mercury, and all at once he forgot to be sad, for the sunlight was shining on the woman's golden hair, and her white arm was stretched out to him in greeting. For some time Epimetheus and Pandora lived happily in the gardens of the earth, and every day Epimetheus thanked the gods for their last and best gift to man. He never tired of watching Pandora chasing butterflies through the tall meadow grass, or making cups out of broad leaves that she and Epimetheus might drink from the clear, cool spring. One day, as they were resting under the trees, and eating their simple meal of dates and wild honey, they saw a traveller coming toward them. He was walking very slowly, and seemed heavily burdened with what appeared to be a large box. While he was yet some distance off, Pandora ran to meet him, and asked him to come into the shade and rest. The stranger was old, and the chest that he carried bent his shoulders almost to the ground. He looked hungry and thirsty and tired. So Epimetheus urged him to stop and rest, and offered him some freshly gathered dates. But the traveller, who was none other than Mercury in disguise, replied that he could not tarry with them, for he had a long distance yet to go. He asked them, however, to take care of his great oak chest, for with that burden off his shoulders he could hurry on and reach his journey's end before nightfall. He promised to come back for the chest a few days later. Epimetheus and Pandora were delighted to be of service to a stranger, and promised to guard the chest with great care. The traveller thanked them and turned away, but just as they were saying good-bye, he mysteriously disappeared, and whichever way they looked there was no trace of him to be seen. Epimetheus was not at all eager to know what was in the mysterious chest, but as soon as they sat down again under the trees, Pandora began to ask a thousand questions as to who the traveller might be, and what the chest contained. Epimetheus begged her not to think any more about it, as nothing could be learned of the old man or his burden. But Pandora refused to be silent, and talked still more of the probable treasure that they were guarding for the stranger. At last Epimetheus got up angrily and walked away, wearied with her insistence. Pandora then went over to the chest, and kneeling down beside it she examined the exquisitely carved figures that were on all its four sides. Then she studied the fine golden cord that bound the chest. It looked soft enough, and yet it was very strong, for it was made of strands of twisted gold and was tied at the end with a curious knot. There was no lock to be seen, and apparently nothing hindered eager fingers from opening the lid, when once the knot was unfastened and the golden cord unwound. Pandora's fingers itched to try her skill on the knot, and she felt sure that if she worked at it long enough she could finally loosen it. The figures carved on the lid were groups of dancing children, and in the very centre was one figure whose face was so strange that Pandora sat for a long time staring at it. Now and then she turned away, and when she looked at the face again, it had a different expression from the one she had seen on it before. She knew that this carved thing was not alive, 
and yet each time she gazed into the strange eyes of the wooden face they were quite unlike the eyes that had smiled or frowned or mocked at her before. She went to see whether Epimetheus had come back, and finding that he was still away, she returned to the chest again, but would not let herself be tempted into so much as touching the golden cord. As she stood wondering what to do, she thought that she heard some little voices coming from inside the chest, and they seemed to say, "'Open, Pandora, please! Please open and let us out!' Pandora looked quickly around to see whether Epimetheus was in sight. Then she came a bit nearer to the chest, and put one hand on the golden cord. Again she heard the small voices, this time very distinctly, and they said, "'Open, Pandora, please! Please open and let us out!' Pandora's heart was now beating fast. What could be in the chest? What poor imprisoned creatures were calling to her, begging her to set them free? She put both hands on the golden cord. Then she looked guiltily around but no one was in sight. No one was watching her except some inquisitive squirrels who were peering down at her from the branches just above her head. Swiftly and deftly she untied the knot, which yielded easily to her eager fingers, but even then she hesitated, fearing the anger of Epimetheus. The little voices cried again, "'Open, Pandora, please, please open and let us out!' But still she hesitated, not daring to raise the lid. Just then she heard her husband calling to her, and she knew that there would be no chance now to explore the contents of the mysterious chest. She must wait for that pleasure until another time. Meanwhile she would take just one peep inside, to be sure that the voices were not mocking her. So she raised the lid very gently, but no sooner had she made the smallest opening than out poured a host of tiny creatures like brown-winged moths, and they swarmed all around her biting and pinching and blistering her soft skin, until she cried out in fear and pain. She tried to fight them off, and rushed away to find Epimetheus, but the tormenting little sprites followed her, buzzing about her ears and stinging her again and again. In vain she strove to brush them away, for they clung to her dress, her hair, and her poor swollen skin. When she reached Epimetheus she was crying bitterly, and it did not need any questioning to find out the trouble for the malicious little creatures were so numerous that hundreds of them encircled Epimetheus, and bit and stung him, just as they had done to Pandora. In the unhappy hour that followed, while husband and wife bound soothing herbs on their bruised skin, Pandora told Epimetheus how her fatal curiosity had led her to open the chest, and set free the host of evil things. It was not, however, until later that they realised the extent of Pandora's folly, for the little brown-winged creatures were all the spirits of evil that had never before entered the world. Their names were sickness and pain and sorrow, envy and pride and jealousy, hunger, poverty and death. All these ills had envious Jupiter put into the oak chest, and bound it with only a golden cord. He knew that sooner or later Pandora would open the chest, and then man's life of untroubled happiness would be for ever at an end. Never again could the gardens of the earth be places where man might hope to find peace. Evil things had taken up their dwelling there, and they would stay for always and always and always, as long as the world should last. When Epimetheus and Pandora saw the hateful winged creatures settling down on the leaves and flowers so as to be near at hand to torment them, they wept bitter tears, and wished that the gods had never created them. In the midst of her sobbing Pandora had not, however, forgotten about the chest, and she was still wondering what else might be inside it, for she was sure that those moth-like things could never have wholly filled it. Suddenly she heard a wee soft whisper coming from within the chest, and it said, Open, Pandora! Please, please open and let me out! Pandora stared in surprise, for she had thought that all the evil sprites had rushed out in that moment when she raised the lid. Was there, then, another host of tormenting things still there, and if so, should she let them out, to add to her misery and pain? Again the little soft voice cried, "'Open, Pandora, please! Please open and let me out!' Pandora now called to Epimetheus, and together they listened to the pleading voice, which was so very soft and sweet, that they were sure it could not belong to any evil thing. Still Epimetheus was unwilling to risk bringing any more trouble into the world, but in spite of her remorse, Pandora was curious to see what it was that was begging so plaintively for freedom. So, with Epimetheus's consent, she opened the lid once more, and out fluttered a tiny little creature with beautiful gauzy wings. 
she flew straight to Pandora, then to Epimetheus, and at her touch all their hurts were healed, and all their pain forgotten. The name of this gentle messenger was Hope, and she had been hidden in the chest secretly by one of the pitying gods, who grieved that Jupiter was sending so many ills to fret mankind. The host of evil beings once set free could never again be shut up in their narrow prison, but wherever they flew, even to the remotest corner of the earth, Hope followed them, and brought healing in her wings, and when the world grew wicked, as it did in the days that came after, so that men neglected the altars of the gods, Hope was still remembered with votive offerings, and her shrines kept garlanded with flowers. 